Hello and welcome back. In today's video we're going to be taking a look at sulfur and some of its amazing properties. Sulfur is a very important element and you come into contact with it every day. It's one of the central elements for life and it was one of the 10th most abundant element on earth. It makes up many important proteins and amino acids within the body, such as hair or the different amino acids that keep you alive. It's one of the more pretty elements in the periodic table. It's a non-metal and it has a nice yellow color to it. It can be found in a natural state, such as on volcanoes, as sulfur deposits, such as these crystals you see here, or bonded with different metals such as in the case of sphalerite, which is a zinc ore, galena, which is lead sulfide, which is lead ore, cinnabar, which is a mercury sulfide, mercury ore, and iron sulfide, also known as pyrite or fool's gold. This falderite also has some inclusions which are iron, iron sulfide pyrite. We're going to be taking a look at a lot more of these elements that are in the sulfide forms as most of these you can extract quite easily and what the ancients used to extract their ores out of. Sulfur is a very important element when it comes to laboratories as it can be used in many many different compounds and can be used in one of the more important acids used by lab technicians, sulfuric acid, which is a very strong acid, which is used in many, many cases. Sulfur is also very used in the pyrotechnic industry and can produce some fun stuff, such as the Chinese discovered if you mix it with an oxidizer and some charcoal, you get black powder. Now, how do we go from a nice ore like this to the sulfur we can use. There's different methods for extraction. Some have been used here in ancient times and some are more modern. You can also extract sulfur from pyrite or any of the sulfide ores by heating it and collecting it. That's a bit more of an involved process which I'll be taking a look at another video when I make sulfuric acid. But right now I just want to extract this out of its ore and get into a pure state that I can use. Now, the Greeks used to use a process where they would pile it all up in a kiln and melt it and have it run down the sides of hills where the volcanoes was and collect those sheets that are formed of the solidified sulfur. But I'm lucky and I have something that the Greeks did not. I have a magical place called Menards where I can buy some xylene, which is a very, very strong solvent and one of the solvents that can actually dissolve sulfur. Now by dissolving sulfur, we can get it into a very pure state and crystallize it out and make it very easy to rid this bottom rocky material from the nice sulfur that we want. It's a quite straightforward process. We're gonna take a beaker, we're gonna throw this into the beaker, throw the xylene into there, fill it up to a nice good amount and throw it on a hot plate. Xylene doesn't really dissolve the sulfur all too well at low temperatures, but by elevating the temperature, you can dissolve it quite rapidly. And then we'll transfer it into another beaker and crystallize it out and we'll get our nice pure crystallized sulfur. And here we have our sulfur in the xylene and on the hot plate and let's turn that up. I threw a round bottom flask on top full of cooled water so any of the volatile xylene that boils off will be condensed back down into it. We'll come back in a little bit and take a look at it.
Now that's cooled down relatively enough that I'm willing to take off the top and transfer everything over so we can crystallize it out because it's starting to crystallize at the bottom and I don't want it all to crystallize in there. So let's do that now. First let's remove the top and dump off the contents over here. You can see almost instantly it falls out of solution. There's still a lot left over here, which I'll have to wash and clean. And I'll do that now. And redissolve it and transfer it over so we get a more complete yield. And we're back heating on the hot plate with a little bit more xylene. And we'll try to recover as much as we can. I don't think we're gonna get all of it, but as much as I can is what I'm hoping for. I'll skip over this as you already saw this before and transfer it into a different container when done. I've given it adequate time to cool and this is what we're left with. A nice pretty beaker of sulfur that has fallen out of solution and the toluene left in there. This one was the first one that we pulled out and this was the second that I collected afterwards. There's a lot of material that accidentally poured off from this beaker into this one, so I don't think I'm going to keep this and I'm just going to throw it away and consider it the waste because there's a lot of the small rocky material that st was stuck to the bottom because the previous beaker, enough of it crystallized at the bottom to keep all the loose tiny material in that beaker from transferring over to the pure stuff over here. So this is going to be a waste along with the waste rock that's here. Now we need to dry it out before we can use it. So we need to transfer the tiling over here and then boil off the rest of the tiling outside so that we get left with a pure product that we can use. Crystallation from xylol forms this nice, beautiful crystal structure that's nice and reflective and shiny and catches the light very nicely. Okay, let's dry it out and then I'll come back when it's all dried out. So I decided to forego the boiling off of the excess xylene that was left over that I couldn't pour off for deciding to pour, add more water to it, which will cause the xylene to separate from the sulfur and then the sulfur will melt at the bottom. Because of the structure of the crystals, it's forming this cool bonding material that wants to stick to itself. It's kind of like that magic sand that you get at the store that all those satisfying videos are made from. The volume is going to decrease rapidly due to the crystal structures taking up more volume and when it's melted down, the crystals are going to shrink. And you can see that xylene layer at the top, which has some dissolved sulfur in it. Okay, here we have our sulfur melted down and now we just have to wait for it to cool into a nice puck before we can take it out of the beaker. Let's take it off the hot plate and give it time to cool and we'll be back when it cools. And here we have our finished sulfur product. Now sulfur is cool as it has the second most allotropes just behind carbon. Now an allotrope is what the material is made out of elemental but in a different structure. The most common that sulfur ones that we saw we actually saw two forms. We saw alpha sulfur and Y sulfur allotropes, which are octasulfurs, meaning they have a chain of eight sulfurs in a puckered ring. Now, 
this form right here is alpha sulfur, which is the most common sulfur found in nature. We had that when we started and while we were heating it, which it also transformed into beta sulfur, which is that cool puffed rings that we saw that were sticking together as it when it cooled and was heating back up. And that is more stable in about 93 degrees Celsius. Now we also saw Y sulfur. Y sulfur is cool because it's formed after cooling in xylene or any other hydrocarbon, which forms another octa sulfur compound, but with slightly different variables and different properties. And as I said before, we're back to the alpha form of the sulfur allotrope. Now that we have our pured sulfur, after I did all the drying processes, which one that I neglected to state before I did it and forgot to film was drying with acetone. Xylene is nearly insoluble in water. Very, very small amounts of it dissolve in water. So if you want to rid the sulfur of xylene, you either have to boil it off, which the melting point of sulfur is a lot lower than the boiling point of xylene, or you can dissolve the xylene out of solution by using acetone to dry it out. And the acetone is easily washed out and can be easily boiled off after you get rid of all the xylene. But with our pure sulfur, we can now do some experiments, which there's only be one that we're going to take a look at in today's video, which we're going to make some gunpowder. Now gunpowder is a quite simple chemical mixture. It's made of three different ingredients, primarily an oxidizer, in this case sodium nitrate, historically potassium nitrate, but I only had sodium nitrate on hand. I do have some lithium nitrate, but as that's so hydroscopic, it most likely won't work how wet it is outside. And it's made up 75% of the oxidizer. And the next major component is carbon, which is 15%, which we made in a previous video. And then, of course, in this video, we made our sulfur, which makes up the last 10%. This is going to be a one gram sample, so it's going to be quite small. Normally, you'd make this in a ball mill, but I don't have to make it in a ball mill because it's such a small amount. I should, but most I'll lose practically all of it as it's only a one gram sample. So I'll be using a mortar and pestle and just mixing the ingredients in there. First, let's add in the main ingredient. Now that we're nice mixed up, let's transfer it to a piece of paper, and then we'll throw it into a half inch pipe cap throw a fuse in there, and then go outside. I'll skip this step, straight forward, and meet you outside. And here we are in the great outdoors. Let's hurry up and get this test done so I can go back inside. We have our trusty torch, and then our gunpowder that we made. Now it's quite wet outside, so I don't know how dry my oxidizer is, so I'm hoping this will work. Let's just give it a go. Well, that test didn't really go as planned. It didn't burn too well. That could be for a whole laundry list of reasons. I don't do a lot of pyrochemistry, so I couldn't tell you what went wrong. My ideas of what the issues could have been is my mixture could have been off, or my sodium nitrate could have had a little too much water dissolved in it, as most nitrates are hydroscopic and like to absorb moisture out of the air. Other than that, I think it went pretty well. It demonstrated the purpose of the oxidizer and then how sulfur is used 
in conjunction with carbon to make gunpowder. It more burned like a rocket because of the fuel grain size. The gunpowder that are found in bullets is more larger pellets. This allows the gas to move easily through it and burn quicker and rapidly. So mine was more of a powder that was compressed, so it burned from the top down from ignition point all the way through to the bottom of the fuel. Well, I hope you enjoyed watching me make some sulfur and getting to play with it a little bit and making some of its aliotropes along the way. If you like my content, please consider subscribing. If you like my channel, drop a like on the video. I'm going to probably be doing more chemistry such as this in the future. I have a lot planned with the sulfur because we're going to make some sulfuric acid in an upcoming video because that's how time works. And if you want to support the channel, check out my eBay store as any money made from that gets sent right back to me. And there's no middleman like make t-shirts and you get something out of it. And if you want a place where you can talk science with fellow like-minded individuals, check out my Discord server. All the links to everything is found in the description that way. And over that way, you'll see more videos of mine because that's how YouTube works. And you should like click on one of them and continue watching so I get my views up because YouTube algorithm likes that. And YouTube's not even going to like this video because I showed fire. That's all. See you later. Well, I don't know, but I've been told uranium ore is worth more than gold. I sold my cad. I bought me a Jeep. I got that bug, and I can't sleep. Uranium fever has gone and got me down. Uranium fever is spreading.